Help me prepare for an upcoming debate. I'm arguing for eternal security and against baptismal regeneration. What do the scriptures say, and what did the church fathers say about this? Hmm. Okay. Um, well, I, I mentioned it in one of my earlier answers about uh, uh, church history, the church fathers. Uh, I really, it became uh, the, the, the norm, the position of baptismal regeneration. And there's a lot of churches, not only Roman Catholicism, but uh, Lutheranism, Presbyterianism, uh, uh, a lot of them, they still believe that you, you have to be water baptized and getting wet is what makes you saved. But your, your spirit's only brought to life. You only have the spirit baptism when you get wet. Um, Dr. Ruckman, he, he, he pointed out that there's two extreme points of view. The, the, those who believe in baptismal regeneration, he called them the water dogs. In other words, you got to get wet to get saved. And then the other opposite end of the spectrum, and there's always usually two extreme points of view on everything. The other end of the spectrum are the hyper-dispensationalists. And uh, Ruckman called them the dry cleaners because they say you, you got to stay dry. If you get wet, you're, you're, not, you're, you're lost. You can't get water baptized. So both of these points of view are, are wrong. Uh, it's easy to prove from the Bible. Bapt water baptism is not cause regeneration. Water baptism is not necessary to get saved. Uh, it should, uh, but it should not be forbidden. It should not be imposed. But uh, we should get water baptized once we truly believe. Uh, we should because we're commanded to do it. Uh, the Bible tells us to do it, to do it. And plus, it's the first best opportunity you'll ever have so that um, once you're saved, it, you're probably going to be a little bit shy initially about telling your family and friends about your, your faith. But if you get publicly water baptized, you can invite all your friends and family to the ceremony. And, and as you're being water baptized, the, explaining the water baptism is explaining the gospel. So uh, you really should, uh, if for that reason, for no other reason but that, uh, it gives you an opportunity to uh, share your faith with it, with everyone. Uh, but uh, early church history, uh, they did uh, start teaching water baptismal regeneration. Uh, and let me see what else. Eternal security. Um, um, well, it didn't take long between much of the Roman Catholic uh, doctrines uh, were developed early in the second century. The idea that uh, you need to get uh, communion, the Eucharist, this communion that we had today, they started teaching that there's some magic in it and that by doing it, uh, you, you get the Holy Spirit. And then when you sin, the Holy Spirit leaves you. So then what's required is you've got to confess your sins and you've got to do penance, uh, or they develop what they call um, indulgences, where you can pay a, a sum to the church, and if you pay the right amount, that uh, your your sins are also uh, forgiven. So uh, these things were developed early in the second century, and much of the church adopted these heresies. Uh, and so obviously, there that you wouldn't have eternal security if every time you sinned you lost your salvation and you had to get it back. So it's teeter-totter salvation. I'm saved, I'm lost, I'm saved, I'm lost. You know, uh, I'm saved, well, now I, I sin, so I'm lost. So I got to get communion and I got to confess and I got to pay my indulgences and now I'm saved again, but only temporarily. That's why Constantine, in 325 AD, you had the Nicene Council and uh, wonderful things happened there. And Constantine made uh, uh, Christianity legal in, in Rome. Uh, and the next emperor made it the official religion of Rome. So things changed for Christianity, but the form of Christianity was already very perverted. And Constantine refused baptism until his deathbed. Why? Because he thought, he believed that at baptism is when you're completely pure and clean and you, you're, you have no sin. So, But after you get baptized, uh, as soon as you sin, you lost your salvation again. So he wanted to be baptized just before he died. So that he would be pure and then die and go to heaven. 
Okay, Ben. Uh, yeah, baptismal regeneration is uh, an absolute water baptismal regeneration is a uh, is a heresy, and I think it you will keep people unsaved because it, it is a work, and people try to uh, do all kinds of sophistry and, and mental gymnastics to teach. Oh well, it's not a work. Water baptism is not a work, so uh, it, it's not part. But but you have to do it. In fact, um, I remember arguing uh, many years ago when I was first really getting serious about my faith and I was still going to a uh, Lutheran church and uh, I remember talking to the uh, pastor about it and he thought he was so clever. I asked him if it was required. He said, well, it's not required. It's required, but not absolutely required. And he thought he was just so, uh, he was so tickled with himself that uh, he was able to come up with that. Uh, it, it sounds like a Pharisee, essentially, you know, coming up, you know, trying to twist the law or rephrase the law somehow. Um, and again, no, it's absolutely not required. If, if, if baptismal, water baptismal regeneration was required, then Christ could not have been risen until everyone who ever believed in him was baptized, until everyone was water baptized. Um, and, and what we do, what do we see instead? No, Christ, again, one of the passages that popped out at me, I always thought was so curious. And then one day it just came to me and I was like, I was so pleased. That was so awesome. Is that? Uh, I was wondering why was Jesus baptized? It doesn't make any sense. And then he said to fulfill all righteousness, because even if we forget to do that or uh, fail to get water baptized, he took care of that as well for us. Again, he's our perfect substitute. So we don't look to ourselves at all. We look at Christ. He fulfilled everything that God required, every righteous requirement that God required. And uh, it's also too, how can a physical, uh, how can a physical act of with water pouring over the flesh? solve a spiritual problem it can't um and so again when we think of the word baptize in the bible i think you, it's important to ring the word out in your mind it, it, it's a wet word for most people and i think we should ring that out um so you know baptize bat, baptism essentially means to be identified with um and here i'm just gonna read some notes i took uh it says, the Greek word baptizo was used in various contexts by various extra-biblical writers. For example, Xenophon in the 4th century BC tells of the Spartan soldiers dipping their spears into pig's blood before going into battle. By identifying their spears with the blood, again that word identifying, by identifying their spears with the blood, the nature of the spear was changed from a hunting to a warrior spear. The dipping into blood was referred to as baptizo, meaning to put into, to identify with, to, to immerse. Euripides, in the 5th century BC, used baptizo to describe a sinking ship. As it sinks, the ship is so identified or baptized or immersed with the water that it no longer floats. Um, baptizo, baptizo was also found in ancient Greek literature connected with the phrase over head and ears in debt. This phrase also gives the idea of being completely identified, placed in union with, or submerged in debt. Um, so again, when we're baptized, all we're doing is it's a it's a uh, a visual way of uh, proclaiming our faith uh, to others. Um, it's a powerful way of doing that. Um, and in fact, there's actually seven baptisms in the Bible. Uh, four are wet, and I'm sorry. Four are dry baptisms, three are wet. The first baptism is the baptism of Moses, and that's in uh, 1 Corinthians 10 2. And it's for, it was for the, at that time it's referred to in 1 Corinthians 10 2, but it's the, 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 uh, it was for the Israelites uh, who uh, fled or, uh, for the, the Exodus generation. Um, the second dry baptism is the baptiz baptism of cup. And that was, uh, Christ took that baptism. Uh, that was his baptism of drinking God's wrath. Uh, another baptism is baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, that's for all, anyone who's ever believed in Christ, they were baptized um, with the Holy Spirit. And that's the baptism that really counts. That's the baptism that regenerates us spiritually. Uh, the new, that gives us the new birth. Uh, there's a baptism of fire. Uh, that is a baptism that's for all unbelievers. Uh, that's in, that's in Matthew 3:11, uh, Matthew chapter 13, Luke chapter 3, and then the wet baptisms are 
baptism of John, uh, for that was for John and his disciples, and that was for uh, when the kingdom of heaven was at hand, when God was offering the kingdom to Israel, Israel alone, the kingdom of God. So that was one wet baptism. Another wet baptism was uh, Christ's baptism, uh, which is Matthew 3. Uh, and then finally, there's the baptism of believers, water baptism, and that's for all everyone who believe as a proclamation or a public identifying, publicly identifying yourself with Christ. It, with, with, you're publicly identifying yourself with uh, his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, and it, there's not a single verse that teaches that you're born again through water baptism. And much more could be said about that, but uh, I think that's a good overview. Oh, by the way, it too, I put no faith in anything the church fathers uh, uh, said. I don't, it, 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 people think that they're somehow infallible. Um, uh, well, first of all, you, uh, you know, you, even if they were, do we, do we have a, 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 an infallible record of what they believed and what they taught? That, that's a big question. And then number two, uh, the record that we do have of what they believed and taught, I think is Luke often, Luke is really an expert on this is that they had, there many heretical doctrines crept in very early. And they were uh, even surprisingly, um, you know, they, they, did some good, they did some great stuff. I mean, they came up with some great creeds and, and solidified through core doctrines, but they also erred early on, I think, and, and didn't have a lot of answers that we have now today. Um, you know, I, I, Justin Martyr, for example, I, don't, I think he's in the 300 AD time frame. I know he's not a church father per se, but people look up to him and say, oh, <clears throat> Justin Martyr, he... He was the great martyr for Christ. Well, if you look at his correspondences, uh, he, uh, I believe he was a lordship salvationist. I don't think he was probably saved based on just, again, just what on what his testimony was because his, uh, in one of his correspondences, I think it was called Against Apion or something. I could be wrong about that. But he talked about his interpretation of Matthew 7, 21 through 23. And his interpretation was that these people, uh, be, they're, because they were workers of iniquity, they uh, were secretly, you know, sinners <laughs> or secretly corrupt. He said, uh, "Again, they didn't. He didn't. He didn't. Uh, he didn't see the faith alone in Christ alone uh, lesson or instruction. There, he saw it as a uh, a warning against not having enough good works, essentially. So, uh, no faith in the church fathers whatsoever. Um, I only have faith in the written word." Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a, a a group we call uh, the, oh, the the Pen the Pentecostals. Um, they um, pretty much believe in two of the things we've talked about: in baptismal regeneration, uh, and in um, uh, oneness, uh, modalism, no, not the Trinity, but the, uh, the Bellianism, where Jesus is the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's most Pentecostal churches, uh, Church of Christ, and, uh, I think they're like that too. But uh, uh, there are churches today that, that hold to these errors. And I saw a video a few years ago by uh, Dave Geisler. Um, I think it's on my playlist, uh, uh, Lordship uh, Salvation Debunked or something. Uh, but it, it is titled uh, something, to, uh, Interpreting Acts 2.38. And Acts 2.38 is where the uh, those people who believe in baptismal regeneration, necessity of water baptism for salvation. Uh, th that's the verse that they go to to support their position. So he teaches on that verse, and I think he does the best job I've seen anybody on that particular verse. So I hope you'll watch that. But one of the points that he made there is that when when we see the word baptize uh, in the Bible, um, first of all, it's, it's a mistake to always think when we see baptism, it's talking about water baptism. The, the default position should be baptism means spirit baptism that we believe we repent by changing our mind about Jesus instead of not believing in Jesus. Now we believe in Jesus. That's repentance. And the spirit baptism is the Holy Spirit baptizes us, indwells us, steals us. Um, and that, that's from faith. It's not from water. 
Well, when you see the word baptize, that's how you should understand it. Unless the context has water. If in the verse it says water, then we know it's talking about water baptism. If the context of the verses around it clearly tell us that this is talking about water baptism, then it's talking about water. But if not, we should not think it's water. We should think it's spirit baptism. Uh, and and uh, the idea, the, the word baptism, baptize should have been interpreted as immerse. Baptize means immerse. But what are you immersed in? No, we're not immersed into water. We are immersed into Christ. That's why, uh, by the way, we talked about Malcolm Smith earlier. One of the truisms we have, I, I took from Malcolm Smith. And he, he says, we believe into Christ. Now, we always say we believe in Christ. But when you believe, you, you are become in Christ. So by believing, we are in Christ. So we believe into Christ. We are becoming immersed into Christ, not into water. So uh, that's really how we should understand this word baptize is being immersed into Christ through our faith, believing into Christ. Um, but he does a much lengthier and thorough, more thorough job explaining that point. But I think it's a, it's the correct way of understanding it. Ben, you have more to say? Uh, well, yeah, actually, so um, a couple of things. Um, I think it's in Acts 2.38. Uh, again, when he says, uh, I think it'd be, you know, uh, he, I forgot the exact context, but he says, what sh they say, what shall we do? The, the audience was saying, what shall we do? And he says, okay, well, you, if you want to do something, uh, you know, again, it, you have to believe, but if you want to do something, he, his answer was more than just, uh, uh, you know, what do you must do to be saved? They said, what shall we do? And so his answer was more comprehensive. He said, uh, uh, I forgot the exact wording, but it, but baptism was part of that doing, you know, uh, if, if you want to do something, it wasn't, you know, what should I, it was, it differed from what should I do to be saved? They said, what shall we do? And so his answer was more uh, encompassing than simply believing on Christ is that, okay, well, if you want to do something, this is what you should do. And again, be baptized, water baptized in that, in that respect. Also too, this is another point that I, I'm, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not being, being dogmatic about this. This is something I'm just, uh, toying around with, and there may be something to this, um, that the, uh, well, I'll say this. So there's a general theme. It starts out in Daniel when it talks about uh, the Messiah coming and that the uh, the desolation of that city after the Messiah was cut off, it would be as a flood. Well, Peter also likens baptism to, uh, in the context of a flood, so, and Jesus was rebuking that wicked and uh, adulterous generation. And so, and also too, is that the Samaritans, when they believed, they did not, when they believed initially, again, the, when the, the Samaritans, when they initially believed, this is not calling about Gentiles, I'm talking about Samaritans and Jewish people. When they believed, they did not first, at first receive the Holy Spirit. It was only when they, the church uh, founders, the, the apostles from Jerusalem came and laid hands on them, did they receive the Holy Spirit. So again, I believe when they believed they were saved, but they didn't receive the gift of the Holy Spirit until they were laid hands on. So uh, there's there very well could be a, 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 a thing. I never heard anyone only talk about this, but I, it, 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 there's definitely a pattern that you could make the case. Um, but I, again, I'm, I'm just throwing this out there for something to think about. Every Gentile, was when they, they received the Holy Spirit when they believed. That's clear. But Samaritans and Jewish believers coming out of that, being baptized out of that wicked adulterous generation, uh, it's possible that they, that they, when they did have to be bat water baptized to receive the Holy Spirit, just that, that Jewish, um, contingent, the believe, the believe, believing Jewish contingent. Again, I'm not saying they had to be water baptized to be, be saved, not saying that at all. And there's an episode also when Paul confronted, um, the John's disciples and he said, uh, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said no. And so uh, it, it said that, that Paul baptized them, and when he laid hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. So there, see, there could be something to that. Uh, but again, salvation has nothing to do with it. Hope that wasn't too controversial. I'm not saying salvation required, the Holy Spirit's required for salvation. I'm saying, all I was saying is there's a possibility that Holy, the Holy Spirit reception for that generation of Jewish believers 
was uh, did require either laying on of hands or water baptism because those are the only contexts that people uh, point to with regards to oh is it required um, for salvation and again I I'm, I'm refuting absolutely it's not required for salvation but re reception of the Holy Spirit they you might have a slight case there but again that that that's come and gone it's not it, that was for that generation of Jews only so um, it's definitely not required for this day and age.